Good morning, every, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Administrative Matters Meeting for October 8th, 2019. Uh, my name is John Kafalas, County Commissioner, District 1. I am joined here by uh, Com Commissioner Steve Johnson, District 2, and Commissioner Tom Donnelly is at a transportation-related meeting, and he will be here uh, forthcoming. It is, the, uh, it is the, the tradition of the board to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the public comment period. And I guess I'm supposed to go get the sign-up sheet? Oh, Steve Johnson will help me. Thank you, sir. It looks like, uh, it looks like we have five people who are signed up for public comment. I think folks know the the uh, the protocol. Uh, three minutes. We uh, I actually I, I neglected to mention that we're also accompanied at the table by County Manager Linda Hoffman, Alicia Jeffers. Uh, in the uh, commissioner's office is timing the the public comment period, and we're very grateful to have uh, Deirdre O'Neill from the Clerk and Recorder's office and her backup person over there, Kaylee. Uh, with that said, uh, the first person that's listed on the public comment period is. Lene Warden, welcome, Lene Warden. Come on, come on down, uh, right there. And for the record, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to speak in front of you. My name is Lene Warden, and I've been a longtime resident of uh, Wellington and um, my comment today is on the issues of oil and gas. This is, an, this is a business and an industry that has long been accustomed to um, having its way and uh, because of some laws that have not been addressed for a long time regarding uh, rights and um, mineral rights over the health of public of the public um, and the right of people, of those companies to make money at the expense of the public. Um, I'm concerned that even as their stock prices are dropping precipitously, as we are having a glut of oil and uh, gas in the world, that um, these companies are still trying locally to get as many new places to drill for the future as they can. We all know in this area that this has been a boom and bust economy and, um, and it has not been particularly good for, uh, for employees um, because of course when they bust the employees go away. I would like to encourage the commissioners to please look at the rules now that we have the opportunity to have some local control to put common sense rules um, that really do focus on the health of people and using some of the guidelines provided by physicians for social responsibility who've done a great deal of research and science on the impacts of uh, fumes and proximity. Um, to, to this and the impacts particularly on young children and uh, children in utero. Um, this is not insignificant. We just get so used to, we're kind of like the, the frog in the warm water that keeps heating up. And this is happening to our climate as well, but I won't get into that as much. I'm talking about local um, oil and gas near where people live, where our water supplies, which are so dear and so precious and so limited. And as we grow in population, and it is, we will continue to grow no matter what. We cannot put uh, a limit on that. Um, and we cannot give up our resources 
for things that only make money for a whole lot of people. And by the way, I don't think Colorado gets enough money from those companies. We're taking it out of the ground. Wyoming does better than us. Wyoming. So, <laughs> but please, uh, think about the health of, the, of our people and the health of our environment first. Thank you very much. Thank you for your words, Lene. Next we have um, Cheryl, is it Cheryl Grease? Cheryl Grice. Grice, thank you. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for allowing me to speak again. My name is Cheryl Grice. I live in southeast Larimer County off County Road 18, very, very close corner to Weld County. I live in the country. We have a fracked well, several wells, within a thousand feet of where my home is. This is my experience. And I don't know if you live close to fracked wells. Maybe you do. Um, I live in the country. The owl that flew from my cottonwood to the little pond by where the fracked well is disappeared. Other birds have disappeared. Maybe a bigger deal is I walk outside frequently and I smell chemical odors. And I don't know if they just get trapped in my little porch corner or what, but they're very strong. I remember once very clearly getting in my car, which was in the garage, driving into Loveland and leaving the windows open so my car would air out. So the odor is just one thing, but I am concerned about what the chemicals are doing to health and well-being of me, but also, more importantly, of children. I'm a retired nurse. I quit my nursing job two years ago. I retired. But children are so affected. Their little bodies are growing. Their cells are growing. It's just, I would, be, I would probably move if I still lived there and I had children in my household. Um, there's data out there. You can see the data on asthma, leukemia. You know what that's all about. I don't think I have to repeat that. But also I would like to say, um, Water is a big deal. Lene just readdressed the water issue. It seems like in the history of humankind, look at the big picture. At first, whoever had food and grain was in the power. Now whoever has oil is in the power. And certainly the United States has produced, produced more oil for 20 years than any other country. I wonder if in the future, and I truly believe in the future, water will be the biggest concern. Whoever has water will have the power. And we are getting rid of some of our water. A fairly, even if it's 2%, that's a big deal where we live in semi-arid Colorado and in the United States. So thank you for listening. Thank you for speaking, Cheryl. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, uh, Ray Sullivan. Is that person here? I, yeah, I don't have a pass today. Really? Yeah, I'll come back. It's a lot of fun to come on up. I, no, I'm not prepared. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have Shirley White. Is Shirley here? Welcome, Shirley. Good morning. My name is Shirley White, and I live in. Uh, southwest Fort Collins near Horsetooth and Shields. Um, I've been watching this situation for several years. Uh, when I retired from nursing, I decided, what's the best thing for me to do now? And I looked around me at all the many things that call for our attention, and I said, in nursing, it's ABCs. If you don't have the airway, you don't have life. And if we don't have our atmosphere, we don't have life. So I'm going to ask you, as um, Greta Thunberg so eloquently said, not to listen to me, but to listen to the science. Savante Ahanas, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, winner of the Nobel Prize in 1903, predicted, calculated, what an increase in carbon dioxide would do to the Earth's surface temperatures. It was calculated in 1903 in terms of a greenhouse effect. He predicted that continuing to burn fossil fuels would cause global warming. We've been ignoring this science for over 100 years. And that has brought us to where we are now. 
facing a monumental global crisis. It's bringing heat waves, droughts, destroying food crops, major storms, floods, forcing immigration away from threatened areas, melting glaciers and precipitating sea level rise. We are seeing the effects. The time to prepare a bridge is not when it's collapsing, but I think that's where we are now. We have to take emergency measures. Perhaps the good news in all of this is that much of this catastrophe is human caused. And what is human caused can be human changed. But we don't have much more time. We, need, we can no longer operate business as usual, commerce and the economy first. Without a planet, without an atmosphere, we won't have commerce or an economy. So we've known about global warming and the threat of global warming for a hundred years, but we've ignored it until now. Extraction of fossil fuels only creates, not only creates carbon emissions, but causes atmospheric carbon when these fuels are burned. So both the extraction process and the burning is damaging our atmosphere. We have a chance now with SB 181 to change how we operate. Let's do it. Let's be leaders. Let's take care of future generations. And I recommend to you this book, The Breakpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. I'll get that later. The, uh, the next person that's signed up to speak is Ed, Ed Behan. Welcome, sir. And if there are other people who wish to speak who may not have signed up, um, maybe would you pass this down? Good Welcome, morning, Ed. Commissioners. Uh, my name is Ed Behan. I've been uh, living in Fort Collins for going on three and a half years now. Uh, previously lived in Louisiana, previously lived in Texas. Um, been watching this oil and gas issue for quite a while now and it's it's kind of haunting what keeps coming back through the news from places that I've lived at there's been a fracked well burning out of control for a couple of months in Louisiana and even when the flames seemingly go down it's still spewing out God knows what and uh, they're not sure that they're going to be able to do anything about it until they get a relief well drilled so Concerns about that, given the concentration of oil and gas development around here, are, you know, they're just fresh in my mind. Uh, we were living down there when the uh, oil spill happened in the Gulf as well. And it's just, it's, it's scary. The general health concerns are, are not to be uh, uh, underplayed, but what happens if something catastrophic should occur is, is also uh, something we need to keep in mind as you look at oil and gas regulations here in the county. Um, I won't keep you long here. What I did want to bring to your attention is a uh, public forum that's going to be happening here in Fort Collins next Monday. I uh, learned about this online, and I just think there's going to be a lot of good information there that you all might take an interest in. There's a few experts who will be speaking there, including uh, most key, uh, Dr. Detlef Helmig from uh, CU Boulder's Alpine Research Institute. He's the fellow who ran the uh, uh, continuous air monitoring at Boulder Reservoir and looking at the specific markers of the chemicals found in the air that you know can be separated out. This is coming from traffic. This is coming from oil and gas development. Um, some some pretty interesting information uh, that he's developed on that. So I will leave you all with this, and I've got a copy as well for Commissioner Donnelly. If you'd be so kind as to pass that on. Thank you, Ed. That's there. Yeah. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. And Mr. John Grant. Welcome, sir. Nice to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. My name is John Grant. I've lived in the Fort Collins area for about 15 years. I've lived on both coasts in my lifetime. 
So I am uh, concerned about sea level rise, among other things. I want to read a short exchange uh, to you this morning between the former director of the Office of Science and Technology, Dr. John Holdren, and an interviewer uh, for the Harvard Gazette, which was published about a week or so ago. <laughs> Uh, a comment from the Gazette. One thing mentioned during the news conference after the report was released, the IPCC report, was tipping points, where a small change creates a cascade of changes from which there may be no going back. Are there any of those that you see as particularly worrisome or likely? I digress for a moment. This does not pertain directly to the issue of permafrost in Larimer County, but we are part of the global system, and this speaks loudly. Dr. Holdren, I think the most wor worrisome one is the possibility that we will get to the point where the thawing permafrost is emitting enormous quantities of both CO2, carbon dioxide, and methane, CH4. We know the permafrost contains two and a half times as much carbon as is now in the atmosphere. Note, two and a half times as much as we already have, which is at 415 parts per million versus a tolerable, sustainable level of 315. We're going up approximately two more parts per million per year. I continue. As the permafrost thaws under rapidly warming Arctic climate, the carbon becomes susceptible to bacterial decomposition. If the circumstances are anaerobic, the decomposition produces methane. If they are aerobic, if oxygen is present, it produces CO2. Methane is worse in the short term. Over a 100-year time scale, the methane is 30 times as potent a heat-trapping gas as CO2 per molecule. We don't know yet at what point the permafrost will have thawed to a level at which these emissions become a really big deal. There's already a lot of evidence that the permafrost is disgorging more, than C more CO2 than methane than ever before from human-caused warming that has raised the temperature. But again, I think the evidence there is stronger than the IP CC report reflects. This is a guy who is my age. He received a undergraduate degree from MIT about the same time I graduated from a university very similar to CSU. He went on to get a PhD in physics from Stanford. Uh, I uh, will paperclip these and send them. I apologize, I've only got one copy. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, John. Next we have uh, Sonia. Sonia Keating. Welcome. Thanks, sir. Good morning. I'm Sonia Ketting. Okay. I live in southeast Fort Collins. Commissioners, as I watched the second oil and gas task force meeting last night, a couple ideas came to me, which I'm thankful to have the privilege to share here today. First of all, there is so much to learn about the oil and gas issue. While Commissioner Donnelly has possibly labeled me as an antagonist, and I expected him to be here today, um, judging from some of his reactions and our inter interchanges, the opposite is actually true. We activists very much honor anyone's contribution toward clean air for our community, and it's that that we seek to protect. All previous movement in the right direction, including that of Commissioner Donnelly's, is obliterated by profit motives from the industry. We could stand here every week forever and deliver new science being discovered about impacts on humans, land, air, and water, and our sorrow over it, in three-minute increments forever. And we do this to support you all. While time and resource committed to the task force is commendable, it's a drop in the bucket. The video I watched last night from the task force mentioned arbitrariness and reasonably regulate as, as breaks on an overreach from environmentalists. 
The problem is with the unfolding and already arrived recent science, even a full out ban, which no one has requested, is quite defensible beyond being arbitrary or unreasonable. And not just because of the ruin of our state's clean air, which we're sure has happened, just ask the EPA, but ruin of property values, collision of zoning, and so much more. The task force has barely skimmed the surface on the hard science. I asked Commissioner Donnelly at a public event, why the rush? And his response was, because you asked us to. It's not the case. We wanted a task force to begin studying rules, not to quickly stamp them out. Times are changing. Why do we want you to wait until rules are passed by the state? Because I don't want County Attorney Frank Hogue to be in the position of defending to the state why we must be allowed to honor an operator's permission that is beneath the state's rule floor. Larimer County should not be risking the legal responsibility of creating stranded assets for developers. We don't need to pay for that legal fight. We're doing our best to bring more education to this process than monthly task force meetings could ever do. We hope that you will attend what we're offering. P.S. I want you to know that our alliance has grown by two large groups and we took second place in the CSU homecoming parade. So I really do believe that we have public sentiment on our side. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, before we close public comment period, is there anyone else who may not have had the opportunity to sign up on this clipboard list uh, who wishes to speak? Very well. Then, Commissioner Johnson, is there any comment you wish to make overall regarding what we've heard today? No, thank you. I would just like to say that um, very quickly that I appreciate people being here. I think it is um, critically important that folks uh, continue to engage from the community uh, on, the, on the matter of oil and gas. I, I, I ask that you not give up on the oil and gas task force and that it is really important that folks engage in that and participate. We, we certainly have one more meeting scheduled and depending on the, the, the outcome of that meeting, we'll decide you know, how this process proceeds. Uh, on the, somebody mentioned water. Uh, I would encourage people to look at our uh, adopted comprehensive plan. Uh, one of the areas that we've identified uh, deals with watersheds and natural resources. And as many of you know, we're in the process of updating the land use code. And I would submit that there are opportunities to further engage in, in that process uh, so that we can try to do things uh, uh, in terms of the, where the county that we call home and how we want to see the county 20 years from now. With that said, wasn't that all great and inspirational? Okay, right. <laughs> I will close uh, pu public comment period and the next agenda item is to approve the minutes uh, for the week of September 30th. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, I would welcome the motion. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the minutes for the week of September 30th, 2019. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Uh, at this time, we have uh, Brenda Jimison, our business operations manager, who will uh, provide us with information about all the wonderful activities that we will be doing next week. Good morning, well, Commissioners. Welcome. On Monday, October 14th at 10 a.m., you have the annual inspection of the jail, and that's at the Larimer County Jail here in Fort Collins. At 1.30 p.m., you have a work session with Lori Cadridge, Intern Director of Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources. At 3 p.m., you have the land use items with the development review team in the hearing room on the first floor. On Tuesday, October 15th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalis will attend the Foothills Gateway, Arc of Larimer County, Spirit Crossing Clubhouse, Summit Stones, Town Bre Hall Breakfast at the Drake Center in Fort Collins. At 9 o'clock a.m., you have administrative matters. That's this meeting here in this room. At 12 p.m., Commissioner Kafalis may attend the Community Corrections Advisory Board, and that's in the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 1.30 p.m., you have administrative direction to the county management. That's here in the Sprague Lake Conference Room on the second floor. At 7 p.m., Commissioner Kafalis may attend the LaPorte um, Planning Advisory Committee meeting, and that's at West Fort Collins Water District in LaPorte. 
On Wednesday, October 16th at 1.30 p.m., you have a work session regarding the 2019 revised and 2020 proposed budgets. At 3.30 p.m., you have a liquor license hearing for 7-Eleven at 200 North Taft Hill Road here in Fort Collins. At 4 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Veterans Group meeting in the Boyd Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 6 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Environmental and Science Advisory Board meeting in the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. Thursday, October 17th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Arc of Larimer County's Community Breakfast at the Drake Center in Fort Collins. At 9 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Colorado Procurement Technical Assistance Center's Fall Seminar at the Fort Collins Marriott in Fort Collins. On Friday, October 18th, at 9 a.m., Commissioner Kavalos will attend the county's and commissioners acting together fall policy retreat, and that's at 1600 Sherman Street in Denver. At 1.30 p.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the grand opening ceremony for the Colorado Highway 402 and I-25 interchange on the east side of the newly constructed interchange. At 4 p.m., Commissioners Donnelly and Johnson may participate in a tour of the Loveland Police and Courts expansion at 810 East 10th Street in Loveland. On Saturday, October 19th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will participate in a joint citizen meeting with Mayor Melendez at the Starbucks inside the Main Street Safeway in Windsor. That would be all I have for the week. Thank you, Brenda. C Commissioner Johnson, do you have any questions or comments? I do not. Great. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we uh, in the, the agenda, we move to the, uh, the portion of the overall agenda, which is the consent agenda. And it, it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five agreements, two deeds, three resolutions, 16 miscellaneous items. Uh, and then there are approval and issuances of various uh, liquor licenses and an issuance regarding a, uh, a, liquor, a liquor store. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, do you wish to remove anything from the consent agenda? I do not. Great. Then would you be kind enough to make the motion? Sure. I move to approve the consent agenda for October 8th, 2019. Thank you, sir. That is a proper motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, do you have any guests, Commissioner Johnson? I do not. Oh. Look at that. We got every we're clearing out the room. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the 2019 uh, Prosecutor of the Year Award uh, recipient. Come on, come on forward. This is great news. Well done. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mitch Murray. I'm an Assistant District Attorney uh, here in the 8th Judicial District. Cliff Riedel, our elected DA, was unable to be here and asked me to represent our office, which I'm very proud and pleased to do and speaking about Kara Boxberger, one of our deputy district attorneys. And I would uh, comment that uh, the commissioners, uh, you yourselves can also feel a bit of pride in this because it's through your support that we have been able to create and maintain a sexual assault crimes against children unit uh, which, in which Kara works. Kara has been a prosecutor for 11 years. She spent uh, a little over five years of that with our office. Uh, her work, uh, for the last couple of years has been in that sexual assault crimes against children unit. Uh, she has some amazing abilities. Uh, she can both sit down with a, a victim, whether it's a child, a teenager, an adult, relate to them, communicate with them, be compassionate to them, make them feel safe. And at the same time, she can bring forth uh, a, a zeal for prosecution to hold those accountable who have committed crimes against these vulnerable people and keep our community safe, uh, which are wonderful attributes. That has been recognized by the Colorado District Attorney's Council. Throughout district attorney's offices across our state, CARE was recognized this year in 2019 as the recipient of the Robert R. Gallagher Prosecutor of the Year Award, recognizing her for her abilities and her work, her dedication, uh, her tenacity. And uh, we're very proud of CARE and wanted to share that with the commissioners. Uh, th thank you, Mitch. Thank you for sharing that good news. It would be wonderful to hear from you, Kara, uh, as far as the work you do, and, and uh, uh, you know, much gratitude for the work you do. Thank you. Um, I have the privilege of every day coming into a job uh, where I get to work with individuals 
who may be going through the most traumatic moment of their life, um, but uh, I have the ability to help them process those traumatic events and move forward um, regardless of the outcome within the criminal justice system. And I have the privilege of working for an office and um, superiors who allow me to uh, do what is necessary to help those victims who give me the opportunities to, to do what I love. And I'm very grateful to have those opportunities and I'm very grateful to work in an office that has a dedicated unit um, to help really the most vulnerable victims that our community has. Um, I love my job. I love working with the members of our community, our local law enforcement agencies, and the other members of my office. So thank you all very much for allowing us to come here today. You're welcome. Commissioner Johnson, do you have anything you'd like to say? I do. Um, uh, congratulations on your award, Kara, and for all the work you do for us. One of the things that is on our minds a lot with folks that deal with children, our child welfare folks that deal with cases of child abuse and such as the cases you deal with is the effect that it has upon the, the folks that uh, work for us and, and, and help these individuals through some really awful circumstances. So I'm curious is how do you personally um, handle the secondary trauma that you're undoubtedly exposed to in hearing the stories. How do you, how do you manage that, and what keeps you going uh, when you have to deal with such sad events like that on a daily basis? That's a great question, and I think first and foremost, for me personally, the thing that helps me every day when I read these horrible stories, when I read these police reports, is the team that we have at the district attorney's office, mm -hmm. the ability to go into any one of my colleagues' offices, any of my superior's offices, um, Cliff's office, Mitch's office, a any of those offices, and sit down and talk about it. And those open lines of communication, um, and also the supports that the office has put in place, specifically the ability to go speak with a professional, if necessary, at any time and the encouragement to do so. Um, I, I think that our office, um, having come from another office, our office is ahead of, of all others out there in that um, if you're struggling, it's okay to say you're struggling and it's okay to go talk to somebody and the encouragement that comes from our administrators uh, to do that. And, and I feel very safe, I feel very able to on those days where you struggle um, to go into anybody's office and talk about it or, or to say, I need a break, if I need a break. Um, and, and to know that, that, um, that that's going to be handled um, professionally and um, allow me to do what I need to process. Um, and the, I think the thing that, that keeps myself, or the things that, that it, keep me going and keep me wanting to, to be in this unit to prosecute these cases is um, for all the bad there is, the good is in the people that we serve us. Um, for me to get to build a relationship with a child or even an adult who's gone through this time and let them know that there are people who care for them, people who want to help them, people who know that that bad moment doesn't define the person that they are and to encourage them to grow. Um, and to see that growth over the course of the case, which can oftentimes be lengthy and difficult for them, but to see that growth, to see that at the end of, of the criminal justice system or their experience, they're able to move forward and do productive things, that's what keeps me going. That's, that's why I do this job, and I think that's why all prosecutors do the job, is because we get to have that direct impact and we get to see the, the result of our work. Yeah, I, I, I'm very pleased and proud that we have a district attorney, Cliff, and staff like Mitch that support our employees because, I mean, you really are an angel to, to those kids and the help that you give them will help them for their whole lives last longer than you and I are around here in the, in the county. That, that good will continue to go on. Um, I wanted to read something from the, the nomination that or the, the award. It says, um, this individual, Kara, 
needed to have performed above average in their profession, exhibited, exhibited dedication to the community, and displayed exceptional courage, initiative, innovation, and commitment while maintaining a professional demeanor and reputation. And that's quite a, quite a recipe of, of accomplishments that you've uh, achieved. And I think it's, I think you do kind of, in many ways, a thankless job because the community, we kind of like to pretend that these things aren't happening in our community. We're a great place to live and bad things don't happen. And nobody likes to focus on those. So you probably don't get a lot of accolades and thanks from the community, but certainly not as much as you deserve. So we're really grateful to have you and have you come. We're honored to have you come and visit with us today. Um, Mitch, have we had prosecutors that have won the Prosecutor of the Year Award in the past? I don't believe we have. I, I don't remember since I've been here either. So we certainly have some get honored worthy, for different and nominated. Things, yes. Yeah, I know. But that's 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 a real honor. And we're really proud of you, Kara. Thank you. thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And I would just add that, um, first of all, thank you for sharing uh, the, the recognition that you received, Kara, and this award, and, and for taking the time to come to the, to the commissioner's meeting so that we can share this with the public. I think that a lot of times uh, folks focus on some of the negative things, and uh, it's, it's easier to complain about stuff, but I think it's really important that, that people in the community listening, there are thousands of people listening at this time. Uh, so, no. but, uh, I'm listening. <laughs> but I, I just, you know, my message is that I, I just, it's important that people hear, you know, the good works that we are doing. Uh, and in this case, you know, you are uh, helping to bring about justice uh, for some of the most vulnerable uh, persons in our community, uh, v victims of domestic violence, victims of sexual assault, uh, child abuse, uh, I assume human trafficking is in there, and, and so for that, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with us, and we look forward to continuing working together to support the efforts of the DA's office. Well, we appreciate the honor and the support, Commissioner, so thank you. Thank you. So Have a good day. If, if it would be, if they don't mind, I think it would be nice if we could get a picture with Kara and Mitch. I, I appreciate you uh, bringing that up because I usually we have a plaque or something and we didn't have a plaque. But I'm, I, if you folks are okay with taking a two-minute pause, and I know Commissioner Johnson really likes to have his picture taken. I dressed up uh, today. I'm <laughs> oh. You look good too, by the way. <laughs> so um, if we could uh, just pause for two minutes and we'll, if you guys are okay with that, we'll go out there and certainly. Um, <laughs> Agenda is the 2019 National and State Recycling Award recipients. Uh, we have our uh, community infrastructure resources, no, Community Planning and Infrastructure Resources Services Director Lori Kadrich and Mr. Gillette. Would you folks introduce yourselves for the record and, and proceed? Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Lori Kadrich and I'm the Interim Director for Community Planning and Infrastructure Services. Stephen Gillette, Solid Waste Director. Welcome. Please uh, present. Yes, I believe Commissioner Johnson is. I move over there. Is familiar with this yeah. award as well, and this is um, a unique award. We understand it's the first of 
the kind in the nation. And it's related to our waste shed planning efforts um, and the cooperation of many communities within Larimer County. Uh, currently, we have three cities as well as the county that have joined together in planning what the waste shed will look like in the future. And for those folks who are more familiar with the waste shed being talked about, how you get rid of your waste at home or issues related to recycling and landfill, that's what we're talking about. And we received two different awards. Commissioner Johnson received a personal award for his work over five years developing the policies related to these agreements, um, as well as our technical and policy group received an additional award for the efforts going into the planning for this work. And as Stephen would say, and I'll let him say it in his own words, he's ready to put a hole in the ground and we're already getting recognized for the work and he's wanting me. to wait <laughs> until we put the hole in the ground to get the work done. But I would ask Stephen to as well comment about the good work since he was there for most of it. Thank you, Laurie. So again, you know, being part of this team and we're very fortunate here in Larimer County to have a regional effort that includes Fort Collins, Loveland, Estes Park, and Larimer County, and soon, <coughs> officially, we'll add Wellington to the group. And, you know, this is unheard of for this regional type cooperation. And the exciting thing about this is, you know, every day people come to our facility and they go, Gillette, why are you burying all this stuff? And I go, well, I'm just a caretaker. This stuff is yours. And the waste shed, the Solid Waste Infrastructure Master Plan, gives us an opportunity to divert up to 40% of these materials away from the landfill. This is unheard of, and we're almost there. And again, as Lori said, I want to see a hole in the ground, meaning a new landfill, because one, our old landfill, 56 years old, is an unlined facility. We need to enter into the 20th century before the 21st century is gone. So we'll develop a modern landfill with all the liners and protections for our air and water. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Commissioner uh, Kapalas, may yes. I add just one more thing? Of course. Stephen has been the director for the solid waste facility for many years, and I think it often goes unsaid. Many. That Say how many. Don't let it go unsaid. <laughs> just a few. Just a few. There we go. And during that time, he knew we would need a new landfill. It was without question that the landfill would have to close and we'd need to move to a modern landfill. And it's with his good leadership and foresight that the county is in a very good financial position to be able to implement the components of the way shed plan, including a new landfill. And I think that the people in this county should congratulate him for that good work because many communities have to borrow money to do this kind of work or band together and his foresight put the county in a very good position to implement the waste shed plan. Thank you, Laurie. Commissioner Johnson, would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, these awards were a surprise to me when we had our waste shed committee meeting last uh, week. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know they were coming, but it's, it's from the National Recycling Coalition. I don't know if they mentioned that, but it's, it's, it's a great group to be recognized by. And, um, the elected officials on the original policy committee, Mayor Troxel, Ross Kniff, Ken Zorns from Estes Park, and Leah Johnson from Loveland also got awards. And I think we all said at the meeting that the awards really were the result of the work of the staff. I mean, everything I've learned about landfills, I've learned from Stephen. Or when I go to different places around the country, St. Petersburg, Florida, Tampa, Florida, St. Petersburg. I went to San Francisco. He always makes me visit the landfills <laughs> in those areas, which I think a lot of people go to San Francisco probably don't go to the Recology landfill. But, <laughs> so I get off the beaten path a little bit. But 
I've really learned a tremendous amount from our staff and to divert 40% from the landfill is especially significant when you realize that Colorado is one of the cheapest places to just bury things. So you really have to get creative to figure out ways that divert other materials from the landfill. I think one of the, we're doing uh, yard waste may be the, the next big diversion from the landfill. Construction demolition products is, is a very big contributor to the landfill volume. Um, food waste and organic waste is coming uh, soon as well. And yard waste and food waste and organic waste, I think, contribute a lot to the methane generation of landfills, which is, you know, is, is actually a pretty significant contributor that we probably don't think of very much. But uh, even at our old landfill that was built in the 60s, Stephen has arranged for methane to be collected and flared, and eventually, if there's enough produce entered into the, um, <coughs> into, the into the gas lines, so that it will not be released into the atmosphere, flaring it changes it into carbon dioxide, which uh, we again learned this morning is less uh, effective as a greenhouse gas. So um, our staff is doing some amazing things at our landfill that I think we should be very proud of. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Well said. And I would just, um, uh, I'm coming at, sort of coming on the tail end of all this, but having attended the Solid Waste Policy Council meeting uh, last week, uh, I was m very impressed about uh, the collaboration and the fact that we're taking it to the next level, the next phases as far as working out some additional details, including the town of Wellington, and certainly uh, making progress towards uh, putting a hole in the ground, as you would like us to do, Mr. Gillette. And, and of course, the issues of 40% diversion, the issues of dealing with yard waste composting, uh, using that material back in the ground, and, and certainly um, related to uh, uh, you know, construction materials, I mean, which is a big, uh, a big contributor to uh, landfills. I think tremendous work being done, more work to be done, and, and I'm glad to be a part of that process as best, as best as I can. And Commissioner Johnson also deserves a lot of credit. I'm glad he got that really cool little plaque with the holes in it. Or it's, it's actually, it's, tell us what that is. Isn't that a circuit board? Yeah, it's a, a re reclaimed, recycled circuit board from a computer. So there you go. Uh, yeah, walk the landfill, and they didn't waste any new raw raw materials to make an award. So. W walking the talk, and you'll be happy to know that sometimes in my household, there's just two of us. Sometimes we don't put out our trash or our recycle bin for a whole month. We just don't have a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't know why I added that. <laughs> in, in any event, I think um, uh, it's, unless there's anything else, uh, uh, yes, uh, County Manager Hoffman, Linda. I would just like to chime in. It's with my congratulations to both the technical team and the policy group. Yeah, I think this whole waste shed study is another example of the regionalism that is so predominant in our community and we're so fortunate to have. So between the work that the technical d team did to get this work underway, um, as Lori pointed out Stephen's outstanding management. He sandbags the budget every year to um, squirrel away those dollars to put our community in the position that we're in in order to be able to not only replace the landfill, but to be very progressive in going forward our solid waste strategies. 40% diversion is an amazing number. And so the policy group is to be commended for supporting that approach, for finding ways to make it financially feasible for our community. And we're grateful for the partnership of our municipalities to help drive materials to that construction and demolition, um, I guess, diversion. And um, it, it's just, you know, I don't go to solid waste facilities on vacation. But <laughs> but I'm very nearly inspired to do so by your good work, Stephen. So congratulations to the two of you individually and to both teams that contributed to this award. Great. Thank you, Linda, for those words. I think at this time we'll, um, we'll pause the meeting uh, for a photo op. I know that uh, Commissioner Johnson has been waiting uh, diligently for, uh, for a whole week for this particular photo op. Thank you.
Yes, please. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Sheriff's Office staffing for contracts with the Town of Berthoud and the Poudre School and Thompson Valley School Districts. Uh, welcome, uh, Captain Loberg. Good morning, uh, Captain Mike Loberg with the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. I'm just here this morning to ask you for consideration for a couple FTEs. Uh, as you know, in addition to providing law enforcement services for unincorporated Larimer County, we provided for a couple of contract areas um, that are significantly growing. The town of Wellington, the town of Berthoud, Hooter School Districts. I'm here to talk about two of those today, and, and the first one is, is probably the easier of the two, and that's the town of Berthoud. The town of Berthoud is actually asking for uh, a phased approach for two FTEs, the first one for this year. Um, the, the second one will we'll come back and address in 2020, but their growth uh, that they're seeing and, and, and the request of the town administration is to add an additional staff for the, uh, for the town of Berthoud. Um, that town will absorb all of the costs of the officer, all of the costs for the equipment. Um, we will train that officer, get them up, 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 to, up and running and provide that officer um, to the town over the course of the next three to six months, depending on training and um, staffing, that sort of thing. So um, something we've done in the past is that phased approach that, that they, they're responsible for all of the financial responsibilities to get that person up and trained. So that is my first request is for the town of Berthoud for that uh, FTE. The second request is for staffing an SRO sergeant, a school resource officer sergeant. And so um, currently we work with three different school districts. Uh, the first one is Poudre, uh, Thompson Valley. We also work with Estes. Um, the, the two major uh, school districts have, have approached us requesting additional staffing, and that additional staffing is because they are beginning to want to introduce SROs into the middle schools. And so we have tried to, to look at this uh, as a broader scope of how we can service both of these school districts with providing supervision to our SROs in two different school districts with two different rules and, and that sort of thing, and as well as providing this overflow for them. So we approached both school districts and asked them to come to some sort of agreement between the two of them um, as to uh, what the supervision could look like. And so um, we came back with the recommendation of providing a, an SRO sergeant, uh, which is similar to what Fort Collins and Loveland does, to, to be able to supervise and, and provide st additional staffing for these officers. Um, but they will jointly share this position. Um, that's where it becomes a little bit challenging as to, as to the agreements. Um, both Pooter and School, uh, Pooter and Thompson Valley work off of a, a, a different schedule as ours. Obviously, they work off the state system, right? So, so July 1. So as of this year, July 1st, Pooter School District already approved the funds to pay for approximately 50% of the salary. We have, we've also approached uh, Thompson Valley. Um, they've come to the table with somewhere between 30 to 40 percent, and I talked with the county manager uh, the other day. I don't have those exact numbers yet. Um, I do know this, that both school districts um, will fund the majority of this uh, project, probably around the, the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent of the, the funding required. Um, I've spoken with the sheriff's office, the undersheriff. We've agreed to, to, uh, to fund out of our current budget the remaining 20 percent, and the reason for that is, is this, is is the SRO sergeant would be able to fill in, in an area that we need um, additional help in, and that's uh, summertime help. As you know, that um, our our high season oftentimes is summer, whether it be recreators or you know uh, red feather areas or, or that type of thing. So the use of that person that can um, help us with some of our staffing needs would 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 be considered during that time. So. Um, I'm here to ask for those two positions, one for the town of Berthoud uh, right now, the other for the SRO sergeant position. Great. Thank you, Captain. Commissioner Johnson, questions? So, Mike, how are, how are the SROs supervised now? So, so currently they're supervised on the contract towns. So I've got a Wellington sergeant that basically supervises about nine people, uh, which in our model, it's kind of against our our span of control to begin with. So we try to operate within five to seven, right? And so I'm asking now the Wellington Sergeant to supervise nine people, which becomes a lot. Um, so that that supervision to the town will reduce. And, and, and the same happens with Berthoud. So Thompson Valley, the majority of our schools currently are in Berthoud, um, and our Berthoud Sergeant absor absorbs that, that uh, supervision responsibility. So this will, this new supervisor will have more familiarity with the schools and be able to devote more time to the school 
functions without so many other duties? Is that approximately yeah. right? Yep. So they would have, uh, well, I mean, all have collateral duties, I would assume, but, but their main focus will be supervising our SRO uh, officers, making sure that they're, they're trained, equipped um, in the schools. Um, and if they're not in the schools, then, then we have that backfill with that sergeant position. So I think this might be a good time to share with us a little bit about what do the school resource officers do? How do they help kids? What kind of benefits? I'm sure they do more than I realize, is because it's kind of why I'm asking. Yeah, sure. What are, what are all the, what all do they do for the kids in our schools? Yeah, so so a, a school resource officer is really assigned to the school to become integrated with the leadership, with the teachers, with the kids. Um, so they they're actually a functioning member of that school, and so they'll go into the school and. It's not that they just park the car out, out front and enforce laws. They actually go in and they'll teach classes uh, during the school day. Um, and each school district have di di different expectations. So I'll use Pudor as an example. In addition to teaching, um, they also have a, a small um, academy that runs after school during the summer. And so we have a two-week gap where our SROs actually serve as a mentor to the kids. And so. The, the, the program is built upon having a relationship with law enforcement officers and establishing what that is early on and, and, and having that um, partnership with the school to help. It, it, we do change behavior, and we, we talk to kids about, you know, whether it be e-cigarettes e or whether it be drugs or alcohol, and, and um, in addition to for enforcing the laws and the rules and regulation. In, in addition to that, obviously, securing our schools. And, you know, if, if I had to pick one priority, obviously securing the schools is first, but we can't just – you know, create a moat and, and harden all of our schools, right? It's, it's got to be a combination of all of the above. And so the benefit of, of the SRO program is that it, uh, it, it develops a relationship with law enforcement and the kids that, that is, is intended to grow. And so we are beginning it in middle school now. We actually will touch our, our elementary schools a couple of hours a day just to go by and have lunch with the kids. Um, so so that, that, that seed is planted. And then in, in middle school it grows, and then throughout high school um, we have a dedicated SRO in each one of our high schools throughout the county, and that's pretty much um, all, all of the school districts wide. I'm sure the officers develop some very special relationships with the kids and the, just the one-on-one -on -one time and helping kids one kid at a time is just so valuable. I think it's great that it must be nice for those officers. I mean, I didn't, I never ever wanted to be a police officer, but I can, you know, dealing with angry people all the time. And I can imagine this is probably a really rewarding position for officers to be able to work with kids and help kids and I bet that's really rewarding and probably a sought-after position. It, it is, and it's it's pretty desirable, you know, to just have that relationship with the, with the kids in the school district. And, you know, I see my SROs all the time, you know, showing their support and wearing the colors, and, mm -hmm. you know, they'll wear yeah. the, the school shirt as opposed to our uniform shirt. And so we just make that tie in to really integrate with the school. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for our sheriff's office. I mean, this is another example, like the manager was talking about, of regional cooperation. Our sheriff's office being willing to help some of the communities in our county that are having issues or don't, aren't big enough for their own police uh, force. What I hear back from the municipal officials is they're so grateful for that assistance and it's such a really good working relationship. And then to work with our schools too and being, being, being willing to support them and help them um, educate kids is, it's, it's really nice to see that regional cooperation. I'm very supportive of what you're proposing. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Johnson and thank you, Captain. Loberg, I, I just have two quick questions. One is, do we have SROs in elementary schools? We, we don't have them assigned to elementary schools. We will visit elementary schools. And so we visit them for several reasons, too. We'll have lunch with them, or we'll be there beginning or end, uh, end of the day occasionally. And then we also do uh, lockdown drills. And so we, if we go in there to do a lockdown drill, one of our officers, one of our SROs will travel from one school to the other. And that's coordinated through the school district. Great. Thank you. And my second question is, Regarding the town of Berthoud, is there a sheriff's annex there similar to the one that I visited a couple of Saturdays ago up in Wellington? Yes, there is. Yeah, there's, a, there's an office. I think we have maybe five desks down there. Um, so that, that town will be our first contract town to take on 24-7 scheduling with the addition of this one officer. So they will now have 24-hour, seven-day-a-week coverage uh, assigned to officers. Not, you know, there'll be vacation time and that sort of thing. But... Uh, on an ongoing basis. So, Great. thank you, sir. Yep. Anything else, Commissioner Johnson? Would you please um, uh, 
say the uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the hiring of two sheriff's office FTEs, a sergeant and a deputy, to be assigned to the current contracts with the town of Berthoud and the Pooter School and Thompson Valley School Districts beginning October 24th, 2019. Thank you. That is a proper motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have the Larimer Small Business Development Center, uh, 2018 performance data and 2019 funding request. Uh, welcome, folks. And I would like the record to reflect that uh, Commissioner Donnelly has joined us. Welcome, Commissioner. Thanks. Let you take over, no, sir. Go ahead. Okay, He's doing thanks. doing a better job. Oh, like that. Uh, welcome, colleagues. Uh, if you would be kind enough to introduce yourselves for the record and then proceed with your presentation. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Jacob Castillo. I'm the Director of the Larimer County Economic and Workforce Development Department. Good morning, Commissioners. County Manager Hoffman. My name is Mike O'Connell. I run the Larimer Small Business Development Center. Good morning, Commissioners. Ann Lance with, I'm the Executive Director of Teaching Tree Early Childhood Learning Center. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Kurt Baer with Loco Think Tank in Fort Collins. Great. Who wishes to begin? I'd like to start. <laughs> so first of all, I want to uh, thank the commission for allowing us to get in front of you today. Uh, I really enjoy the the, uh, the opportunity when we get to, um, I guess, brag about our partnerships, um, talk about how we work to support businesses and the nonprofit community in northern Colorado. And, um, you know, it's come up a couple times this morning about regionalism and how, how we work together. Um, I think this is a great example of, of both. I mean, economic development, you've heard me say, is a team sport. The county doesn't do this alone. We work with a number of different organizations and entities throughout uh, northern Colorado. And the way that, that we're able to do more with less, you know, in this world of diminishing resources, the way that we do more with less is through smart partnerships and, and collaboration. And the partnership we have with the, small, the Larimer Small Business Development Center, uh, I think, pays dividends for, uh, for the business community in northern Colorado. It supports the county's role in uh, business outreach and working with small businesses. And it gives us an ability to, do, uh, to have the capacity to touch um, individual businesses and the broader business community with fewer resources. So one of the things we're very uh, aware of is um, how the reduction of duplication of effort and what what our department has done with the Small Business Development Center I think really speaks to efficient and effective service delivery in northern Colorado and it's our investment in them that allows them to uh, do great work and uh, partner with us so with that I'd, I'd like to hand it over to Mike to walk Mike O'Connell to walk through uh, his performance measures this year um, we'll We'll move on at the end to, you know, again asking for the um, the support to invest twenty thousand dollars in the Larimer SBDC, and you'll see that uh, that is a worthwhile investment uh, when when Mike reports on his metrics and performance. So, Mike, I'll run the slides for you. Great. Unless you want to swap seats? Nope. You're like. you're great with that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, yeah, Jacob, for for, <laughs> for the introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for your past support of local entrepreneurs and what we do. Next slide, please. Um, our mission is pretty simple. You've heard it before. We do street smart business education and connection to resources. And we do that via the three legs of the stool that are up there that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, we have roughly uh, 40 consultants. Most of them are here in this picture from our last consultants meeting. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you can come in and get free one-on-one -on -one consulting from a restaurant and food expert, from a retail expert, from a financial person, from a, a nonprofit person. So it's a very valuable, um, <clears throat> very valuable learning uh, resource for the entrepreneur. When you walk in our office, you see bios, as you see on our website, of all of the consultants. You might find somebody that resonates with you, and you can say, hey, I would like to talk to Tiffany that owns Stuff Burger there on Main Street in Fort Collins, and she'll give you some restaurant assistance. So uh, great to get it from some real-world individuals that have uh, been, in that, been in that world. We also do a whole bunch of classes. Uh, this is Franklin Taggart. He did this class to help businesses and nonprofits with how to do a podcast. We had 80 people attend this class. Uh, we're trying to keep uh, 
uh, keep pace with, with what's going on with current resources and tactics for the business owner. Next slide. Uh, we are also, um, uh, we do a lot of classes about digital marketing. However, uh, we also want to emphasize uh, personal relationships, uh, how to do sales tactics on a one on basis, because that's an important part of it as well, not just the digital world. Uh, as far as our metrics, uh, the gray area that you see up there is our data for the one-on-one -on -one consulting. <clears throat> Last year, we helped uh, 948 clients. Uh, that was a pretty high number uh, in the state. Uh, they got over $4,500 of free consulting. And then the bottom two rows, uh, we did about 100 classes. Most of them were done at our office in the Innisfere, but we also did about 30 at the Loveland Business Development Center, which is in the Loveland Chamber of Commerce, for about uh, close to 1,300 uh, class attendees. So as you see from the 2015 column, the, the word is out. We're a good resource. We've got a lot more people coming to see us, a lot more people that are hitting us earlier in their process to get the benefits that we provide. This is our client distribution. This would be for the one-on-one -on -one consulting. It looks like a, about like I would expect it to. About 60% of them are Fort Collins residents, 28% Loveland. We did have an emphasis that we were trying to beef up those uh, segments in the upper uh, left-hand corner, which is Wellington, Estes Park, uh, Berthoud. We worked pretty hard on that. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, three full-time consultants in Estes Park now, so on a per capita basis, we have more consultants in Estes Park than we have anywhere else. Uh, and we are also working to funnel birthed clients into the Loveland Business Development Center instead of putting out the word you need to drive to Fort Collins to see us. So that's broadening that perspective. Uh, we do track what we call economic impact. These are our big five metrics. Did we help the business get started? Did we help you retain or create a job? Did we help you increase your sales? And then did we help you borrow any money, which is the capital infusion part, or get investor money? And I'm pretty happy to say that we put up some really sterling results last year. We helped 61 businesses get started. That was number one in the state out of 15 SBDC centers. That was bigger than Metro Denver. That was bigger than Colorado Springs. That was bigger than South Denver. So very pleased with that. Uh, jobs retained is uh, we're engaging with a business. Did we help them keep the jobs? We engage with a pretty high percentage of existing businesses, uh, not just startups, which is helpful. Uh, we also helped uh, 307 jobs, new jobs get started. That was second in the state. We helped our clients grow their sales about 24 million. It's not a huge number, but considering these are mostly small businesses, that's a pretty big uh, factor. And we also helped our clients borrow about $18 million of uh, money to fund their businesses. That was also number one in the state. Um, and just to show you comparatively, uh, you've seen the slide before, the flat, thick black line that you see at about the 6% number, that is Larimer is about a percentage of the state of Colorado. So if you think of us as a GDP number, I took those five metrics and I charted them out as far as our percentage of the state of Colorado numbers because all of our SPDC centers track data the same way. So you can see that even though we're about 6 to 7% of the state, uh, our SPDC is producing about 20 to 15% of the state's SPDC. PDC's total economic impact. So we're hitting way above our weight class here, and I'm pretty proud of this slide, obviously, because you see it at every, every meeting. Um, we've got some new stuff going on for next year. Uh, this year, we just finished on Thursday our fourth annual Northern Colorado Women's Entrepreneurial Business Conference. We had 250 women entrepreneurs there. It was a great event, had it at the ranch, um, and we'll continue to do that. That's been a very productive event. Uh, with a lot of positive comments from the women entrepreneurs. Uh, we would like to be able uh, next year to add a program coordinator. We've had the same full-time staff of three people for years, but the workload has gone up quite a bit. We can add independent contractor consultants, but the staff still needs a bit of a boost. We're working with the city of Fort Collins to do more as far as coverage to the Latino business community. Uh, it is not really our forte as far as outreach, so we're partnering up with organizations that do a better job of that, City of Fort Collins Library, La Familia, um, to see how we might get to that community. I already talked about doing more in Berthoud, Wellington, and Estes Park. Um, we're always working on funding for our center. Uh, recently, we did get a grant from the uh, Blue Ocean Foundation, which we were uh, happy to hear because they do support what we do. And I'm going to talk a bit about our Scale Up Smart program, which is our existing business program. 
Uh, this is just a shot of our three consultants in Estes Park. The gentleman on the left, Rich Chappie, is our lodging expert. Uh, uh, Ken Smith in the middle is a generalist. And then Jason Owens on the right side is also a generalist but works with a lot of the creative businesses that are in Estes Park. Uh, these are some of our success stories from last year. Uh, if any of you have driven by the south end of Terry Lake, you see a whole bunch of those Volkswagen Vanagon vans. That's in the upper left-hand corner. They haven't been made for 25 years, but there's a company called Rocky Mountain Westy that's made a $6 million a year business from refurbishing, souping up, customizing these Volkswagen Vanagon vans. So I love this. He's built a business. Nobody's made the product for 25 years. So that's a niche that we really like. I can't say I was a Westy fan, but uh, some people are. <laughs> um, it, in the upper right-hand corner is Aved. They make uh, 3D printers, fast-growing Loveland business. Uh, over in the uh, lower left is uh, Yemen Apek, uh, photographer, does a lot of food photography business. We gave her a lot of help with client identification. And then Home Care of the Rockies, they got a lot of uh, grown, have grown from about 10 employees to about 80, uh, helping seniors stay in their homes. We've given them a lot of help on staffing, on accounting, financial structure, et cetera. So. Uh, but at this point, uh, one of our success stories earlier this year was the teaching tree, which went through some expansions. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Ann Lance, who's the executive director for the teaching tree, and just let her say a bit about her organization and how they uh, worked with us. Yes, SBDC in action. Um, we were very excited to have be a partner with them. Um, like tell you a little bit about what we do. So we're a not-for-profit organization in uh, Larimer County. We provide affordable, quality child care. Uh, we have a center in North Fort Collins um, connected um, to what was the United Way building and also a center in Loveland. And as you may know, um, our community lacks affordable, quality child care. You've heard the headlines. Everybody's heard. <laughs> um, and so Teaching Tree stepped up. We decided to, to take this on and to see what we can do for expansion. Um, worked with United Way, who shared the building with us. Um, they gave us the thumbs up to to expand into their side of the building. Um, but we knew we had some work to do. And that's why um, we were referred to um, SBDC and I connected with Mike um, I needed some help um, the biggest part was um, convincing you know it was a city-owned building so I needed to, to create a business plan uh, to take to the city of Fort Collins to say this is good use of your building and we're gonna be here for a long time and really show that financial structure um, and Mike helped me with that I mean I could have easily probably googled something and made that work but I really needed the feedback and um, I needed an, an advocate and that's what Mike really became my advocate for me um, he, he went to my board to convince them that hey we have a 2.1 million dollar campaign that we need to raise funds for um, convince those members to give the thumbs up and then help me really um, bring together financials and structures and put a business plan in place that I could t send not only to the city of Fort Collins but to my funders. Um, I had quite a few folks that I needed to raise funds from um, different foundations out of Denver and a business plan was the first step so great resource for me and really a great advocate and we Oh, it's going to be wonderful. So let's let's share. We are in phase two. In two weeks, we move to the United Way side of the finished part of the building. We will move all of our kiddos and our staff, and we will then phase two will begin, and we will, we will start renovating our current side of the building, and we will open our doors. Gen I'm saying early. You know how construction goes, so I say early next year to 214 children. Um, ages six weeks to five at providing affordable child care in our community we're, we're thrilled so if I can just connect a couple a, a couple dots you know our invest <laughs> I can hear the chuckles but, um, <laughs> generally you know, our investment in, in SBDC one. impacts you know Anne's a, a ability to deliver child care, which we know is a systemic uh, issue, not just for, for families, but for businesses in our community. So you can see how the ripple effect of this, our, our investment in SBDC, how it impacts broader economic issues and the individuals and families who need child care in our community. I should also mention, I have children uh, who attend Teaching Tree, and this is a, a top flight organization, have uh, a young daughter who just left after five years, 
uh, at the organization. And in spite of me being her father, she's very well prepared to move into kindergarten and matriculate as high as she uh, as high as she can. Um, so I, you know, the work that they do is is really excellent in the community. So thank you, Anne, for telling your story. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Kurt, Thank Kurt, you. Ann. Would you like to? Oh, uh, what Ann, uh, however, uh, did not mention is that fortunately it was a real well-run organization under her guidance. So it was. We had some parts to do on the financial part as far as putting the story together, but the underpinnings were very solid. So thank you for your your work on that, uh, and thank you for your comments. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. If you look at our focus services, the free consulting. Uh, that is what I consider down in the general part here. And I want to talk a bit about the high growth potential for generally existing businesses, which we also do. I'm going to talk a bit about the Scale Up Smart program in a little bit. But what I'd like to do uh, next is to uh, uh, turn it over to Kurt Baer, who started uh, and is the founder of a peer advisory organization that we've partnered very closely with. So Kurt, I will turn it over to you, sir. Thanks, commissioners. And thanks, Mike. Uh, and Mike should get credit for, you know, when he got to SPDC, I'd been involved as a volunteer for over five years, and it was kind of bouncing off the bottom in reality. It was a hard organization to really refer people to for help, and they had a few stalwarts, and you know, growing that team of consultants from 10 to 40 over the last five years or whatever is just a, a great feat. So anyway, uh, he's humble, but I wanted to brag on him a little bit. Um, so Loco Think Tank, um, so uh, some of you guys know me, or at least by reputation. John, nice to see you. But uh, I was a longtime banker, and I was trying to start a restaurant, and I needed a low-priced, highly effective peer advisory model in my life, or I felt like I wanted that anyway. And uh, I was also consulting at SPDC and knew that they wanted to increase their engagement with the small business community. And so we kind of started a, an initially kind of underground uh, collaboration where some of my facilitators, so our, our business model is basically that I'm the salesman and administrative person and website and whatever for a small business owner peer advisory chapter. They mostly learn from each other with a four-hour monthly meeting. And then there's structure applied by a retired high-achieving business veteran that is in it more for the give back than the big paycheck. Um, so I have now uh, seven different, now eight different retired or semi-retired business people that, that work for a relatively modest paycheck so that I can charge a, a relatively low price. And then they're the minder of the chapter. So each person just gets their own chapter. And they run the machine and learn from each other. And, and I build the, with a diverse group so that they can have people that are smart in finance and marketing and things like that. So we've really grown to be um, kind of a celebrated collaboration with SBDC. They host three of our chapters at Innosphere, one in the Loveland uh, Business Development Center. Um, and uh, you know some of those outcomes that, that Mike gets to report are the result of our members attracting capital and hiring people and growing their revenues and things like that. So it's a kind of a win-win. And uh, ultimately, like Mike said, we've got eight chapters around just Fort Collins and Loveland. I'm, I'm building a team right now and finding ways to find facilitators in other marketplaces um, and try to equip them to launch kind of an abundance mindset. Everybody wins, uh, give back, and grow the, grow the skill set of our business leaders so that they can pay their people more, so that they can find the right trainings through SBDC and business valuations and overall we're trying to attempt to be another a, a private for-profit business that also brings value to the community and uh, and then we have a, I should mention Thinkerfest on October 25th mm -hmm. is an all-day learning event marketing development and leadership and it's at the Marriott this is the second year event but we hope to make it an annual event that uh, you know tracks a uh, dozens initially and maybe over time hundreds of small business owners to uh, just have a day of connection and learning. That's kind of what we're about. Um, we say perspective, encouragement, and accountability. It's a pretty lonely place uh, at the top of a small business um, can be. So thanks for Thank your you. ears. Uh, and I am a fan of peer advisory. I mean, you might have eight to ten non-competing business owners together. It is lonely at the top. I can attest to that. And they share a lot of issues in a safe space. Uh, it wasn't exactly in the SBDC's wheelhouse, so we were really happy to collaborate with what Kurt's doing, and it's, it's made for a powerful combination. 
we have a program also for uh, existing businesses called Scale Up Smart. I talked about this a bit last year. You can get a bit more in-depth help on strategic direction, financial help, manufacturing, shop floor optimization. Uh, there is a uh, $990 uh, fee that goes with each one of these, but we're doing a lot more of the work here, and we've probably put uh, about 15 Larimer businesses through this program. So what we would like to ask you for, folks, is uh, 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 this year, last year you sponsored us $20,000. We have a bit of a twist this year. We would like to ask for the $20,000 again. But we are also requesting, uh, uh, under Jacob's guidance, also an in-kind contribution of uh, some office space up on the fifth floor in the, uh, the workforce uh, building for a north office for us and the reason we are requesting that is because next summer we are be going we are going to move our main office from the Innisfere to the Front Range Community College campus as you've seen there is a big healthcare building that's under construction when that's completed there are various medical healthcare departments that are going to be moving in that building it's going to create some low cost no cost space for us there on campus so we will be making that move so we're going to have a main South Fort Collins office we'll have a North Fort Collins office with Jacob's help and assistance and then we still continue to collaborate very closely with Loveland Business Development Center so it's going to be a broader coverage of entrepreneurs uh, I believe so as um, as you know my department has seen some contraction in its funding and we're, we're also looking at uh, jettisoning some of the square footage on the fifth floor uh, to accommodate current and future staffing needs uh, but we didn't want to go th this is not full-blown austerity measures for our department this is a smart investment in getting businesses the support systems they need in a location that that really fits uh, how and where they do business so as the SBDC headquarters, if I could call it that, migrates down to Front Range Community College, having a northern outpost really works well for SBDC customers and clients, uh, works well for SBDC staff, and I think it's a really smart partnership with the county uh, to have an SBDC presence on the fifth floor here. And as a reminder, uh, we have the Colorado Procurement and Technical Assistance Center also co-located in our in our department so uh, small businesses would be entrepreneurs individuals who are looking for uh, workforce training or other services offered in our department have closer to a one-stop shop um, here in northern Colorado we think you know my, my budget can support the in-kind contribution and this request is you know approving a twenty thousand dollars that uh, we have earmarked for this in the Economic Development Partnership Fund. So not just a reminder, this is not new money, not a new request. Uh, my department's covering the space need. Um, and you, you've heard the stories. This is a, a worthwhile investment. Uh, uh, with the last slide, I'll have Commissioner Cavallo. Sorry, question? Pardon? Uh, do you have a question? Sorry? No, I just, please. Okay. Uh, and a quick reminder, this is how we currently get funded on the macro level. Uh, we get an SBA grant that's federal. That's about 25% of our budget. Front Range Community College comes close to matching that. Uh, those two parties make up about half of our funding. And then we get some money, uh, 40000 from the city for Collins. We do charge for our classes. The one-on-one -on -one consulting is free. There is a low cost for the classes. That makes up about another 25 to 30. Uh, the city of Loveland, through the Loveland Chamber, also sponsors us. First National Bank, Independent Bank have been longtime sponsors. And we also get uh, sponsored by the Town of Berthet and the Estes Park Economic Development Corporation and uh, several other smaller banks. And then Larimer County is at the top with your uh, $20,000 contribution. So. At the macro level, everybody puts in a relatively little bit, but overall we get a pretty vibrant entrepreneurial support structure. And that's the end of our formal presentation. Could we field any questions or? Thank you, thank you, Mike and colleagues, uh, for your comprehensive and informative presentation. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions, comments, observations? I do not. I have a couple questions. Yes, I might turn my mic on yet today. Um, Thank you for the presentation. It was really um, very informative and, and looks like great work is being done at our local uh, SBDC office here, which is Thank not you. a surprise to any of us sitting on this side of the table, but I'm, I'm glad that uh, maybe some folks are um, perhaps listening to this meeting and hearing about the, the good work you're doing. So um, thanks for coming down, Mike. Uh, what, you're providing services in Loveland. Are you based in the, um, the Loveland Chamber offices? Is that where you're... 
currently officing out of? The Loveland B Business Development Center is in the Chamber Building, but they are a separate organization. Uh, we do have an MOU between our two organizations. They're funded solely by the City of Loveland, and it's managed through the Loveland Chamber. Uh, but we work pretty closely with them. We exchange consultants. They use our client tracking software. We run the same classes. And the objective is it should look seamless. Somebody can go to Loveland, somebody can go to Fort Collins, and they can get pretty much the same level of help and guidance. But Loveland does fund that organization themselves. And so that, that really serves as your um, Azure office for South County. It I does. Mean, so business owners in Berthoud and yep. – in uh, Johnstown, inside Larimer County, in Johnstown, pro will probably utilize that, and probably even Windsor would utilize that. Uh, the services provided by the that south southern office. That's correct, and we actually have had meetings with the Bertha Chamber just to make sure that hey, you can send folks to the Loveland Business Development Center because it's so much easier geographically. Sure, and then um, the question here is it's really two part, and I think that the first part is a very simple um, answer, and that's to um, uh, renew our our um, yearly contribution to the services provided which we've done for many years and I don't I don't know how many but for for many years since you've been since you've been involved in the organization I think we've always funded you that to me seems seems simple um, to and so I wanted to know you, the other side of this proposal is to move one staff person into our county office building. no our uh, there's a uh we have a full-time staff of three people, myself, okay. an assistant director, and then a administrator. Yeah. So all of us will be officed in the uh, Front Range Community College campus. However, we can set up consulting meetings where we have consultants that live here. They live in Old Town, so they can come here and they can meet the client here if that would be more convenient. We might choose to uh, run some classes here at the north end of oh, town. But there's a whole level of logistics that we will work out to make sure that's that's seamless for the client and for the consultant. Okay, so it's it's more like a conference room space or, or consultation space or something like that during the we day. A, we'll have a uh, dedicated cube, mm -hmm. access to private offices. So if, if staff or consultants want to come in, they have a workspace, then access to private offices, and then access to um, some of the shared meeting space. Mm -hmm. We can have our literature there. Uh, you know, there might be 15 classes coming up that will be promoted there in that office as well, too. That cube. Uh, the question that may, I, hmm? the question that I have, is that I, the motion speaks to the uh, recommended um, grant of twenty thousand dollars, which you've done in the past, but it doesn't speak to the in-kind donation. Is that because it's considered an administrative matter or should that be included well I'd, I'd defer that to you for us you know the way we um, included okay. the we way we've we done the space in the building well the, the those decisions are made by the manager exactly. so hopefully you've spoken to her <laughs> that was a well, there, there is a precedence for us having partnerships like this um, in the county with other organizations and, again, feel it's, it's great for the business community to have um, downtown location where they can meet. And, you know, our departments work very hard to have the perception as being um, an ombudsman for the business community, a place where people can come and having some co-located services, um, I, I think, helps us get to the next level. Uh, thank you, Jacob. So at, at this time, I would encourage you, of course, to have further conversations with the county manager to work out the details. And it looks like this motion focuses on the uh, uh, the $20,000 grant. With that said, I would welcome a motion from either of my colleagues. Yep, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move the Board of County Commissioners approve granting $20,000 from the Economic Development Partnership Fund an established fund to support economic development efforts in Larimer County to the Larimer Small Business Development Center to deliver and grow services here in Larimer County. Thank you, Commissioner Donnelly. Donnelly that is a proper motion. All in favor say aye. 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 That, is pa that passes 3-0. Congratulations. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a nice day. Appreciate it. Thank you. I hope I can come and read to the children sometime. <laughs> we'll put you on our list. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again for your support. Thank you. What do you read? <laughs> oil and gas regulation. <laughs> <laughs> He'll read a copy of The Nation to them or something. I don't know. Yeah.
Thanks a lot. So moving right along, we are now at that part of the agenda. Uh, the county manager's update, is that correct? Thank you, Commissioner. We look forward to hearing the good news that you have to share with us. Well, I'll try to deliver some good news. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the first piece of good news is that um, we are underway and coming out of the ground, as they say, in construction with our expansion to the Loveland Police and Courts building. And you'll remember that we are doing that work because when we built the first in Denver site, the city council had asked us to concentrate the more uh, judicial related functions in the Loveland Police and Courts building as opposed to putting services like probation in our new office pe uh, building. So that caused us to do two projects instead of just one. So there will be about 10,000 square feet added to the southeast portion of the Loveland Police and Courts building. Uh, the, the, I'm going to call it the slab is poured. The um, steel was going up when I had the opportunity to tour with Ken Cooper, uh, David Bragg, the construction superintendent from Hazelden, whose first name was Robert and whose last name I don't recall, and Mayor Jackie Marsh. So the four of us donned our hard hats and uh, kicked the dirt a little bit, and we're excited to see that that project is underway. Another thing that is going on this week is uh, you'll remember that we are trying to get a best and brightest intern through the Department of Local Affairs. And the way that that program works is the state covers a portion of the, the uh, intern's salary and benefits, and the county picks up the other portion. It's, it's supposed to be about half and half, but our, generous, our benefits package is a little more generous, so we'll be picking up a little more than half. There are the in, the interns would be masters in public administration students, and we would get them for two years full time. So I appreciate all the good ideas that the department heads and service area directors came up with projects that that intern intern could tackle, and we have a large number of applicants. Um, mm. I'm guessing that essentially every intern in the program has applied to Larimer County, which I don't mind. Mm. So uh, that's exciting. Mm. I have continued my conversations as usual on you know, coordination and that kind of just relationship building. And this week had contact with the treasurer's office, the assessor's office, and the sheriff's office for various reasons. Some of those were related to budget. Uh, we are honing in on the last parts of the draft budget that will be going to the press here uh, in just a day or so and out for review next week. Uh, you, the statutory deadline is October 15th. We will make that. And then I know you are looking forward to the exciting presentation of that budget in a work session on the 16th. I, it's probably a highlight of your year. And so uh, I, I can see the enthusiasm on your faces as we discuss it. So that's the news from uh, my world. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Uh, colleagues, do either of you wish to share some of your activities? She cleared the room. Yeah. Through a riveting activity report. That's good because usually your activity People were running off to do new tasks. They were inspired. Sure. I'll go first because I'll be brief and I can tell Tom won't be from, oh. the, from the list he's been writing down. Expensive list um, of things. Yesterday I had my Meatloaf Monday meeting. Ooh. Good discussion. Um, also, How was the meatloaf? It was really it's, it's <laughs> good as always. Uh. It passed my inspection. It's the best <laughs> and brightest. Inspection. Best and brightest of the meatloaf. And also <laughs> last week was the first meeting of the new Waste Shed Policy Governance Council, whatever we're calling it now, where yeah. there's two representatives from wow. each entity. Twice as many awards yes. to give each other. Well, there weren't twice as many awards, but there were twice as many people. <laughs> and Commissioner Kafalis joined me as the other uh, Larimer County But I didn't get an award, Commissioner Johnson. I noticed that. Well, there's a participation award. But They'll thanks be for coming. being in my picture. It was nice to have at least okay. one colleague there. Uh, we can retake it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Photoshop you in. <laughs> but uh, we discussed the 
a lot of input from folks about the the, the whole campus. They were very curious about the the campus, what where all the things were going to go on the current landfill site. The Wellington representatives were very interested in the plan for the new landfill controlling waste and litter blowing away, and they were very interested in haul routes. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, uh, Stephen and his group uh, have proposed three different haul routes from the transfer station, which is the current landfill, up to the new landfill in Wellington. That way, um, no one will receive all of the burden of the of the truck traffic. I think there was 30 trips a day or something yep. around that. Yep. So that should, you know, if you use all three routes, be just 10 truck trips a, a day down some of the roads. So, well, I think Wellington residents were very representatives were very appreciative of having those alternatives to lessen the impact on the roads around their community. That's it for me. I'll yield the rest of my time to the oh. lengthy report. Oh, to follow. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my apologies for um, being late this morning. Um, and so I'll start with that item. I was actually representing Larimer County at the BizWest CEO Roundtable on Transportation. It was a number of folks um, from uh, business community, local governments, both Larimer and Weld Counties. Uh, who got together to talk about um, really some of the, the most pressing statewide and regional transportation issues facing us. It was a large group. So unlike this, um, this setting, I didn't get to speak as much as I typically want. And so, right? And so, um, but I, d I did get my shots in, Commissioner. You'd be, proposal. You well, I didn't get to it enough. I mean, I wanted to more, but um, we focused on a lot of other things as well. And so, um, there was a one certain Weld County commissioner there who was a little, um, who has a kind of a little bit of an anti-tax bent, and so um, that was that was a challenge. Speaking of her, um, I also uh, had a nice meeting last week uh, with representatives from the town of Wellington, including the mayor and the um, and the manager and and uh, the chair of the Upper Front Range Transportation Planning Region, which is Commissioner Kirkmeyer. Um, Wellington is come to, Wellington desires to leave the Upper Front Range uh, Transportation Planning Region and joining uh, and join the North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is um, probably makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the nearest communities to them, including Fort Collins, Windsor, um, Timnath, and Severance, are all part of the MPO, and so uh, Wellington will probably be included. Um, mandatorily uh, following the completion of the 2020 census. They'd like to get a uh, jump on that now, control their own destiny a bit, and set their own boundary for inclusion. Um, makes a lot of sense to have uh, all of Highway 1 inside the same planning region, for instance. So it doesn't have to be in two different plans, and, and so if pri it wouldn't have to receive priority f um, uh, funding from in two different planning regions to gain um, a successful project in the in on that quarter and so uh, there's a lot of real um, important reasons why they should why they should be granted um, inclusion in the MPO um, the process does require an affirmative vote from the planning region they are seeking to leave which is the upper front range um, that was the purpose of our meeting was to be introduce that subject and um, you know the reality is is um, well I, I never have said it before but by God I'm becoming a fan of term limits for some reason I don't know why uh, and so um, if, if nothing else will we will be waiting on that discussion for I guess 15 more months I won't be somebody else's deal to take care of um, the North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization did meet last uh, last week. Um, I'm trying to think of what we talked about. I can't give you an update, I guess. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the manager and myself both re did uh, a couple things together last week. First, we represented the Board of County Commissioners at a um, regional solutions meeting related to water strategy for Larimer and Weld Counties. Um, I guess I guess it was hosted by the Community Foundation. Uh, a lot of our municipal partners were there, um, managers and mayors, um, and uh, and I think what they talked about was was positive things. They they really think we and and I agree we need a more comprehensive strategy with regards to uh, 
to water rights and 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 what we're going to do on that front to ensure that that water here locally is is kept here um, perhaps uh, a denver uh, municipality might come up and try to buy our water that potentially could happen i suppose and we'd want to be prepared if that did happen and so that's a good discussion to have um, we were i mean they've already developed a lot of um of work on this front and uh, so they the, frankly the counties were invited a little bit late to this um, table although they although they assured me that we were right on time at the very early stages it felt like a lot of work had gone into it that, prior to our inclusion and so they uh, I would admonish them that they need to include the counties um, from now on in, in these discussions because truly we've actually done we're the only we are the only um, entity in the state of Colorado that's actually done a water sharing agreement which is actually w which was contemplated in the Colorado water plan we're the only we us and actually Broomfield we did a we have a irrigated farm south of Berthoud and we've got a water sharing agreement between the county uh, as a, as the agricultural uh, manager of that property and the town and the city of Broomfield to use that water in in dry years um, it's a it's a strategy that like as, a, as i mentioned that the state envisions um uh, being used um broadly throughout the state we were the first to, to do so and and we could not actually truly couldn't find a local partner to do it so we had to do it with broomfield and so uh, we bring a lot of expertise to this um to this issue and um and and we've been very very collaborative on that front and so uh hopefully um my colleagues will be included in in future discussions um, on our water strategy right after that meeting the manager and i hopped on over to the uh me oh not you never mind nothing else well you weren't as manager no. but you were you went on vacation immediately after that you went on vacation but i actually and i went and attended the uh, love and birth at board of realtors meeting and um presented on our um uh sales tax proposal uh, uh for the ballot this year and we actually gained support from the loveland birth at board of realtors so i don't know um fort collins chamber is supported loveland birth at board of realtors is supported i don't know about the has the loveland chamber contacted us Do you i know? don't know i i don't know anything one way or the other but the number of uh entities that have uh that, that are supporting this measure is really growing and so uh good good for us that's all i have commissioner uh thank you commissioner donnelly i'll just i'll try to be brief here but uh <clears throat> last tuesday i will succeed in being brief but last tuesday i uh, went to city hall fort collins city hall and attended uh they had a proclamation to recognize hispanic hispanic heritage month uh it was well received there was a, a lot of enthusiastic people in the audience People were very happy that we were recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month. And, and of course, um, uh, Dia de los Muertos and all of those are important events that happen in October. On Wednesday, I attended the second session of the Water Literate Leaders Class. And so I am learning a lot about water rights, water administration. Uh, this particular meeting was at the um, Union Colony Civic Center. Mm -hmm. And our host was the, um, uh, the Greeley City Manager, who I actually met with about a month and a half ago who was kind of giving me some uh, beginning information about the process that you described, uh, Commissioner Donnelly. But that's, that's a great class, and uh, my hope is that it'll in, uh, educate me so that I can be better informed as we take on these, these very complex issues uh, related to water. On Thursday, I had my Wellington community conversation. We had about 15 folks or so, a good discussion. In my subsequent uh, community conversations that will occur in November, and, and December, at least the early part of December, I'm planning to have the uh, folks from our budget department come and, and talk about you know, where we're at with the budget process. That, that promises to be very riveting. You're welcome to join us. Um, but I think it is important that we inform people about how that process works and how they can engage. Uh, I also, on Wednesday, there was a really good meeting uh, we had um, with the Poudre Valley REA regarding some of the broadband potential broadband collaborations so we had a meeting in the administrator or in the uh, Lake Loveland room uh, to discuss uh, our work you know the county's work on broadband and how we might collaborate with Poudre Valley REA 
Friday, I, I was at the state, well, I participated via phone for the State Board of Human Services meeting. And then Friday evening, I wasn't able to join my colleagues in the parade. I hope you had lots of fun. But I attended, um, there was an inspirational uh, women's exhibit at the Global Village Museum across the street. And it's really quite fascinating. A lot of focus on the suffrage movement, a 100-year anniversary coming up. And also, they had a, a great Dia de los Muertos exhibit. So if you're... Um, if it's open, which I think typically it is, it's a great place to go visit and see what they have. That's all. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Commissioner, yes, um, can I ask a question? Of Clarifying course. question? Of course, sir. Um, if it's, if it's uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, why didn't you not bring a proposal to the Board of County Commissioners? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question. And I, I um, just, it was an oversight. And I'd like to us uh, for us to consider doing that next year. Ah, very good. And then also, um, you know, Commissioner Johnson and I are huge fans of uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You know that, right? Yes, I do, C Commissioner. Good, Donnelly. good Republicans like us. Yeah. That's all I had. Uh, that's great. So I see that we have no legal <laughs> matters. Uh, uh, Linda, do we have anything else for today? Not today, Commissioner. Therefore, respectfully, the. Oh. oh, and one other thing I was going to mention, oh. I forgot, in my activity report, oh. uh, yeah, Commissioner Kafalis actually ran the Longview Marathon last weekend. Yeah, the full marathon, 26 miles, yay! Yeah. And he only walked for like 100 yards or something. I mean, just a very, very short amount of time that he even had to take, stop to take a sip of water. And otherwise, he ran the entire thing. And his wife ran a ha the half marathon. Yep. That's pretty cool. Good job, man. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, no other business before us. The uh, administrative matters meetings for today is adjourned. Thank you all. You got to sign the back.